Wednesday night Bible study, and tonight we are in Hosea chapter 2. That's Hosea chapter 2. Uh, before we get started, is there anyone that has any prayer requests before we get started? I just want to open up by saying I want to pray for those in Chicago. Um, I got news that they had a parade there for this holiday today, and a bunch of people got shot. Five people were killed, and another 19 were injured. So just want to pray for those people and their families that, that are going through this situation. So once again, before we get started, is there anyone that has any prayer requests? All right, if not, uh, Brother Stevenson, if you don't mind, Brother, would you open us up with a word of prayer? Sure. Let's pray, uh, brothers and sisters. Our God and our Father in heaven, hallowed be your holy name. We are grateful to you, dear righteous Father, for another opportunity of life. Another opportunity, Father, for uh, uh, to be able to straighten up whatever things we may have crooked in our in our soul uh, before we close our eyes on this side of heaven uh, eternally. And Father, I pray that each of us have already resolved in our minds to work out our soul's salvation and to do it with fear and with trembling. I pray that we always humble ourselves under your mighty hand. And dear God, we will never be lifted up with pride. Uh, Father God, we just thank you, Father, for uh, the freedoms that we have in this country. Uh, to be able, Father, without fear of molestation from anybody on the outside, preventing us from doing what we are doing, Father, this very moment. And that is pausing out of our day, uh, using this technology, Father, to share one another with one another your, your, your infallible, your divine, holy word. And we pray that peace like this can continue to prevail, uh, Father, until you send your son Jesus back in every land and every country, dear God. And we, we, we are just so grateful for moments like this, and I pray we never take it for granted. Uh, Father, I just want to pray for those that Brother Green has just mentioned, those who in Chicago, Father, right now, who are who are grieving, uh, Father God, who are dealing with, with fear because of evil men, uh, Father, who allow Satan to, uh, Father, control their thoughts and their minds to, to cause them to, to take life that's created in your image. Uh, dear God, we know that, uh, Father, it is, it is a Satan. We know that, Father, it is nothing good, uh, Father, when life and blood is shed. And so, Father, we just pray that these families will, will Father, look to you um, for a source of strength and, and comfort, dear God. We, we pray that, Father, that, that they would use these opportunities to search their souls, those who are still here, and, and understand, dear God, that we all need you and, and we cannot make it without you that we're fighting a spiritual battle. And that's really what it is at the end of the day. And we're not fighting what we see. We're fighting an, an unseen uh, spiritual realm, dear God, that can only be won uh, and can only be victorious if we just keep our hand in your hand. And so, Father, we just pray that they will, will find comfort uh, during these trying and troublesome times. This world is out of control. Uh, it should not catch us by surprise because you've already told us in your word that it'll be as worse as, as it has ever been, uh, Father, whenever you send your son Jesus back. I just pray that we will do our part uh, to point people to the place of salvation in our homes, in our communities, at our jobs, wherever we may go. And Father, we'll be soul winners for Jesus. We love you so much, Father. We ask for your presence to be with us. We pray that you be glorified in the things that we study. And I pray that when we say the last amen, every one part of this study can say with all his heart, that they were sincerely glad that they took time out of their schedules to study along one with another via this Zoom. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that prayer, Brother Steve. So once again, everyone, we are in Hosea chapter 2. And with that being said, I'm going to ask Brother Jared, if you don't mind, my brother, could you please read verses 1 through 5? All right. Yes. First one. Say to your brethren, my people, and to your sisters, mercy is shown. Bring charges against your mother, bring charges, for she is not my wife, nor am I her husband. Let her put away her harlotries from her sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. Lest I strip her naked and expose her as in the day she was born. 
and make her like a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. I would not have mercy on her children for they are the children of harlotry. For their mother has played the harlot. She who can see them has behaved shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, and my my oil and my drink. Thank you for that, my brother. Is there anyone that has any questions or comments concerning these scriptures? I guess, yeah, yeah, the comment, I got a comment. It's just, it's just God going over and saying his wife is the children of Israel. And, and it's a high, high, but the anger he, the anger he's going through with them, he's comparing it to idolatry. And I mean, he's not idolatry to adultery. And that's what I got from reading this. And thank you for that, Brother Jared. Do we have anyone else that has any questions or comments concerning these scriptures? Yeah, Brother Jared, exactly right. You know, because when we started off, this book is a, a, a book uh, that shows God's love for, for his children, Israel, uh, and is showing God's love for his people. And Hosea is having to live uh, that experience. Remember being told to go out and marry a promiscuous woman. A woman who God knew would go out and eventually, and, you know, sleep around. And to Brother Jerry's point, God looks at that um, when he comes to his children, when you serve other gods, worship other gods, it's looked at as spiritual adultery. That's really what, it's, that's what it is. When you're a friend of the world, when you are putting any noun, any person, place, or thing before God, understand something. That is an idol, and God is a jealous God. That's what God is. God is a jealous God, and he looks at that, that thing that you put in your heart before him, he looks at that as spiritual as spiritual adultery. This is why James comes along in James chapter 4, in verse number 4. You remember James, uh, the brother of Jesus, says this. He says, you adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy, as an enemy of God. And so what God is doing in, in Hosea chapter 2, uh, through, through Hosea, is he is having Hosea to prophesy to the people of God and, and let them know that I know that you're unfaithful, but I'm pleading with you to come back to me. It's gonna, I'm telling you, what we're seeing in these studies is the love of the God that we serve. This is what we're seeing. And so God, through Hosea, says, I know you're unfaithful, uh, but God is telling them, I cannot be a husband unless you divorce this world. That's what he's telling them. Uh, look in verse number three again uh, that our brother read. Uh, matter of fact, look at two. He told you he needed Hosea to plead with his mother. I'm not going to go through all of this. And then he says, for she's not my wife. Neither am I her husband. Uh, and let, notice that. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms. Put away the idols is what he's saying. The things that's keeping you away from me. And then in verse three, he's going to say something. Lest I strip her naked and set her as in the day she was born and make her a wilderness and set her like a dry land and slay her with thirst. So what is God saying? The things that you're calling your God, the things that you believe you need most, the thing that you believe provides for you, God says, I'm going to show you something. I'm the one that provided for you, and I'm going to take it away from you. And, and this is a way God will, will show us that he's really all we need. We can make sure we understand that. That God is saying, I can take away the things that you think gave you the things that you have, the things that you think bring you joy. God says, I'm going to take that away from you to show you that I'm the one that gave it to you. And at the end of the day, I am the one uh, that you need. And so, but because she wasn't doing that, God says in verse 1, I'm not going to have mercy even upon your children. God said, I'm not going to give your children. Why? Because your children are going to follow down that same path. And that's why it's important, too, that we who are... Christians in the church that we set the right example in the home to the love that we have for God because it will have an effect on our children's spirituality and their love for God down the road. It can have an effect. Thank you for that, Brother Steve. So go ahead, Brother Carl. Well, just a quick comment. It just sort of reminds me of the of the, of the message that the angels had for the seven churches uh, in the book of Revelation with the exception of the two. Um, how disobedient they were, leaving their first love and so forth and so on, just being distracted. And it just goes to show you how easily 
we can allow the things of this world to distract us um, to the to the extent where he's looking at us as as an adulterous generation. You know, not necessarily the entire church, but as long as we don't, what is what does it say in verse chapter three? Um, spoil our 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 remnants, um, our remnants that we're not a part of of those that are uh, that are acting outside of of the commandments of God. Um, is, is, is basically my comment, but it just reminds me of those seven churches that's in the book of Revelation. Thank you for that, Brother Coffee. Do we have anyone else that has any questions or comments concerning the scriptures that's been read? Uh, if not, Brother Coffee, you have something else? You still have your hand up? Okay, if not, uh, Brother Clark, if you don't mind, could you please read verses 6 and 10 for us, please? <clears throat> therefore I will will uh, <clears throat> excuse me therefore I will hedge up her ways with thorns I will build a wall against her so she cannot find her path she shall pursue her lovers but not overtake them <laughs> seek them but shall not find them then she shall say, I will go back or return to my first love, husband. For it is better for me than it is now. And she will do not know that it was I who gave her grain, the wine, and the oil, and lavished her with silver and gold, which they use for Balaam. Therefore, I will take back my grain in the time, in, in its time, and my wine in its season. I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. But now I will uncover her lewdness in the sights of her lovers, and I know now. Excuse me, I'm using my glasses. And no one shall rescue her out of my hands. Thank you for that, Brother Claude. Is there anyone that has any questions or comments concerning these scriptures that's been read? And yeah, so, you know, what we have what we have here is God is calling them to, to end their unfaithfulness and and he's gonna show uh, Israel how he's gonna help them do that. Uh, how he's helping them. Notice, if you would, the I wills in the verses that, that, that we're going to see. Verse 6, I will. Verse 7, I will. Verse 9, will I. Verse 10, will I. And I can go through verse 11, will I. So God says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something. And what is, notice what God is. Remember, brothers and sisters, what we're reading is for our learning. See, again, we cannot just be reading this just to get academic knowledge and learn a little history about what happened to Judah and Israel. These are some things you and I need to learn. And I'm telling you, what God is teaching you and I from the children of Israel is God will give you a wake-up call. God will give you a wake-up call. He'll show you the stuff that you're going after, the stuff you think you need. At the end of the day, it is you. That's what he's showing you. He said, I'm going to put look, look at verse 6 again. Therefore, below, I will hedge up your way with thorns and make a wall that she shall not find her path. See, God will not let you be successful. See, God, and, and the reason he doesn't do that is because he loves you. So, you know, you know, the old adage, thank God for the unanswered prayers. You know, the things you think you need or the things you think bring you joy. Uh, God said, no, 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 I'm going to show you something. I'm not going to let you get to these things and go down this road that you think that's going to bring you joy and you're going to leave me out of the equation. And that's what God is saying. And so God said, I'm not going to let you be successful. What you're going to find at the end of the day, everything you are searching after is vanity. It's emptiness is what God is showing you. He's going to make sure that they come up, that they come up empty in the things that they're looking for. And God, he does that. You know, I think about when I was reading this, I think about the prodigal son. You know, and I noticed what the father did in the prodigal son. Gave him what he wanted. But what, once he got out there, what did he end up? He ended up empty. And at the end of the day, he found out that, hey, what he needed the most was back at home to be under the umbrella of, of his father. Uh, in Luke chapter 18, uh, Luke chapter 15, I do want to read just this verse here, Luke 15. Notice when he finally came to his senses. I like that the Bible says that, when he came to his senses. I know that's right. Verse 17, 
uh, the Bible says, and when he came to himself, he said, how many, Luke 15, 17, how many hired servants my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise, go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and no more word to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. What, what had to happen, though? He had to find out. He didn't have nothing else. He understood what he had back at home uh, with the father was better than anything uh, that the world uh, had to offer him. And so... God is, is doing us a favor uh, when he doesn't let you or I get the things that we think we need uh, to bring us joy. You know, again, if you think you need something other than the Lord to have joy, then you're sadly, you're sadly mistaken. And so God's going to make sure that you don't get it. And at the end of the day, you see that, that he's all that we really need at the end of the day. Thank you for that. Go ahead, Brother Javier. Well said, uh, well said, Brother Henry. I also want to add concerning uh, this chapter uh, I was reading. Uh, Baal, uh, Balaam, uh, is mentioned it several times in this chapter. And when it comes to other gods, to when it comes to cheating, God doesn't want us to have other gods. The god of, of the, as the Bible mentions, the Donians, the Hittites, as they had it in the Jerusalem, uh, the God of other nations, the Philistines. And today there's a multitude of gods. There was a, the God of, called money, there's a God called the, the Christ, belongs to the Baptist, and there's the, the God of the Methodist, of the Presbyterian, of Jehovah's Witness, which is another another Christ, another God. And so there's some that detach themselves from the body of Christ, and they go to those other gods. And so the sin of this world, even the Bible mentions that the God of this world, which is Satan, you know, and what he provides, the things that he has, even as he told Jesus in the book of Matthew, chapter 4, all these things will I give you if you bow down and worship me. You know, we know what Jesus said afterward uh, concerning his statement, you know, get behind me, Satan. Um, when it comes to the Jews, they were always trying to test, they were enticed, and then they became a part of their everyday doings, their diet, their, after they learned the doctrine, they got to love it. So we have to discern between what God has said, what man has said, and the morality that the world is representing. So we know what is good and what is true versus what is a lie. Because Balaam, Baal is a lie. But the way it's presented, why are the Jews so in love with Baal? Because there is a presentation, a storyline behind this God. There is a promise is made behind this God called Baal, and they believe it, and they see it, they hear it, they hear the advertisement, they hear the different stories of the other nations, and some of the Jews confessing, hey, Baal did this for me, uh, you know, if this happens, you just worship Baal, and pray to Baal, and he'll give you this, and give you that, which is, it's all a lie, because we know in the heavens, Baal does not exist, he's not up there, it's all in the mind, they just made him up. He is not sharing a throne with Jesus the Father. He is not up there. He, he, he doesn't exist anywhere up there. It's all a lie that they made up and they got popular. So I just wanted to add that. God bless you. Thank you for that, Brother Javier. Uh, is there anyone else that has any questions or comments concerning the scriptures that's been read? Yeah. Uh, Can you hear me? Barely, Brother Dave. You're, we can hear you, but it's real low. Yeah, I, I don't know what's going on. I, I could try to talk louder a little bit, but I just wanted to emphasize uh, basically what Brother Stevenson has said, uh, that there is a lot of I wills in verse 9, in verse 10, in verse 11, a lot of I wills in verse 6 and verse 7. The, the idea is, though, in my opinion, is that God has not done anything yet. He's given them warning. He's giving them time to get their act together. And that just shows to me the compassion that the, that if you insist on going down this path, you will have all of these things happen to you. And it's certainly, it's certainly better for you if you join me and, and get the benefits of being with the righteous God than all these things, all these negative things. So it, it just seems to me that he's given her, them time and that's, and that's what we need to repent. If we have to repent, we're given the time, and God will respect that, and we can come back to Him. 
Thank you for that, Brother Dave. Do we have anyone else that has any questions or comments concerning these scriptures that's been read? Yeah, I want to add to it. Thank you, Brother Dave and Brother Javier. I want to make sure we all understand who Baal was. Baal, Baal was considered a rain or a sun god. And so you had these these Jews who were worshiping, as, as Javier said, this fictitious God. We got to know something, brother. So there's only one God. Yeah, people can can make up stories like Javier said and and say such and such gave you this and did this. But at the end of the day, everything you and I have that's good, it came from one God. Because there's really only we got to know that there is only one God. Even though many other people may claim other gods, there's no such thing. It's fictitious. It's made up. And so I bring that up because in verse 8 of what we're reading, Hosea 2, for she did not know, talk about his wife, the uh, children of Israel spiritually as well, for she did not know that I gave her corn, so all, everything he got came from God. Wine came from God. Oil came from God. Multiplied her silver and gold, so God blessed them financially. It all came from God. Now, that was what they were doing with God's stuff, though, which they prepared for faith. So they were taking all of God's blessings, all the things that God gave them that was good, and they were giving the God Baal the credit. They were offering it to Baal, this God. Now, what's funny about this sun God, so they believe the sun God provided, made the corn grow. Uh, and God is proving through Elijah that there's only one God. Uh, Baal is not the God of the rain because the God of heaven will make sure it don't rain for three and a half years. And, and so until God says it's going to rain, the true God, then that's when it's going to rain. So Elijah, Elijah proved that, and Elijah proved that to Ahab and to Jezebel were, were God's children, were Jews. But then I like, I like the Battle of Mount Carmel uh, that we read. And remember, that's against the prophets of Baal, too. Now, what we have to know is what Elijah knew. Now, Elijah, in 1 Kings chapter 18, he gives this challenge. I'm not going to read all this, but he gives this challenge of uh, what he wanted them to do to build the altar. But he says, the God that answers by fire, uh, that eats up the sacrifice, he is a true and living God. And, uh, and, and, and the one that doesn't, you know, doesn't answer, we, we know it's not God. My point is, when Elijah gives that showdown, he allows them to go first. I, I love that. He allows them to call on their bell, on their sun god first. Remember, high noon too. It's 12 o'clock. Sun is in the middle of the sky. They're screaming loud. That sun beaming. They're screaming and they're cutting themselves. But my thing I like, they Elijah let them go first. Why? Because he knew that the bell, the god that they claimed to serve, was not real. And that's why he can mock them. That's why oh, maybe he's on a journey. Maybe he's in the restroom. Maybe he's in the laundry. Maybe he can't hear. Maybe he's asleep. Because at the end of the day, he knows their God is not real. He knows who the true and the living God is. And so once they got through with all their foolishness, and he finally said, okay, now my turn. He builds the altar, and we understand who the true God is. The God that sucked up his sacrifice that was drenched with water. And so my point is, we have to understand there's only one God, and we should not be going after, seeking after any other denomination, any other group. we got to know that the Church of Christ is right. That God's spirit dwells with love. The God, the, everything that we have comes from the true and the living God. Your job, your breath, the clothes you have on the back, your, the roof over your head. It came from only the one God that created the heavens and the earth. And we should never, ever, ever, saints, ever get beside ourselves in thinking that anything else can take the place of the God that we serve. Thank you for that, Brother Stevenson, and I'm glad that you and Brother Javier made those statements, because, and I'm not trying to get off topic, but this is just on my mind to say it. Uh, this past Sunday, I was in Sunday school, and the uh, brother that uh, normally teaches wasn't there, so they had a replacement, and during the lesson that we were going through, uh, this brother made a comment that kind of, I'm trying to think of the right way to phrase this, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Um, he was talking about um, other uh, beliefs, I'll use that. He was talking about other beliefs. And he made a statement that, you know, who is he to judge a person for what they believe? Um, they, they may be good people and so on and so forth. And who am I to say that they're wrong at this, that, and other? Now, I'm thinking to myself. You are a brother in the Church of Christ. And as he was saying these things he was saying, I looked at him and I raised my hand. I said, well, that can be answered in one question, in one word. I said, doctrine. 
you know, that's where they fall short in their doctrine. You know, how can, and I use the Catholics as an example, and he kind of tried to like shut me down to keep me from, I don't want to get into all of that, you know, and I'm like, why not? You know, you're sitting up here making comments, so basically you're saying that, you know, who are you to judge when the Bible tells us to judge with a righteous judgment? And if you are allowing yourself to think and or believe that a person that believes in the Catholic faith will make heaven their home, and this guy is supposed to be such a good friend of yours that you've been knowing for years, why wouldn't you share the truth with him, you know, of the gospel and try to help, help him, you know, to lift Christ up to him, that Christ may draw him to himself, you know, and, and that kind of bugged me because I'm like, how could you have such liberal thinking? You know, especially, you know, you're supposed to be a soldier for Christ. And for you to sit up here and say that, that just, you know, when you all talk about these other gods and, and how, you know, worshiping these other gods can take you away from the one true God. And I'm thinking, hearing the comments that you all are making, if you agree with somebody that believes in another God, or if you would, because it, it makes me think about when, the, uh, I think it was Jeremiah, please help me, but this if I was wrong, when God told him to go tell them, and he said, and, and if you don't, your dead blood will be required of you or be on your hands. And I'm thinking that same thing, you know, you had the opportunity to, to help this man by showing him the truth. But instead of you, well, okay, it's okay for you to believe what you believe, and I believe what I believe, you know, now thank you, Brother Javier Ezekiel. You know, now is I look at it as that, that guy's blood would be on your hands because you had the opportunity to tell him the truth. And by you want to be friendly and just get along with everybody, you know, because there are times when we read the scriptures that Jesus, the apostles, and, and Stephen, and you know, that they didn't agree with them when they knew that they were wrong. They told them the truth, whether regardless of if it cost them their life. You know, so I'm sorry, brother, and I didn't mean to, to you know, get away from you know, the study, but that was just on my mind when I heard the comments you brothers was making. Go ahead, brother Jared. Yeah, I'm gonna make it short, but, but yeah, it's the same thing you just said, brother Green. It's like at my job, it was this woman who she was doing training to be a manager. And she just like, she just like that man you described me. She told me out of the blue, asked me what church I go to. I was like, no, I was, I was, I was saying, but she, and she said out her own mouth, like, you go to Abdel Church of Christ. So I was like, all right, that's cool. So that means you a member. Uh, she was like, yeah, she was like, she know all the rules. But she was telling me, you know, I don't argue with people about about their beliefs and all that you know i don't get caught up in it and i, I yeah i was talking her about them bringing her to the scripture that jesus command let's go out to the ground and preach the gospel she said i'm not gonna argue with, with you about that you right you you right and they that's just gonna be it. like that that was, amazes me i mean she don't go to my congregation because if, if she was there that would have been addressed to the uh probably to the full team yeah i'm glad you turned that up Thank you for that, Brother Jared, and thank you, brethren, for those scriptures that uh, you all br uh, brought up, and I appreciate that. Is there anyone else that has any questions or comments concerning uh, the scriptures that's been read? If not, Brother Lewis, if you don't mind, could you read verses 11 through 15 for us, please? Brother Lewis. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't hear it. Uh, could you come back to me, brother? I'm, yeah, dri I'm yeah. driving a moment. Oh, okay. I didn't know my brother. Okay, no problem. Uh, okay. Um, brother uh, Javier, if, if you're able to read for us tonight. Yes, sir. Could you please take verses 11 through 15 for us? So I will also cause all her mirth to cease. Her feast days are no more than her Sabbaths. And all her solemn feasts. I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, where she hath said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me. And I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, wherein she burnt incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings, her jewels, and she went after her lovers. 
and forget me, said the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her her vineyards from thence in the valley of Hakkar for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. Thank you for that, Brother Javier. Uh, is there anyone that has any questions or comments concerning these scriptures? I, I have one real quick. Uh, these verses that Brother Javier just read, uh, especially the one in verse number... Uh, verse number 11, when it says, I will also cause all her mercy to cease, her feast days, her new moons. Could this scripture be compared with Amos chapter 8? Was this like when Amos was prophesied? Because I remember at Amos chapter 8, where it talks about um, he, he will get rid of the new moons and the Sabbath and the solid feast days, so on and so forth. So it was Israel still doing the same thing during the time that uh, Amos prophesied it, this same, basically the same thing in Amos chapter 8. saying Hosea is prophesying to uh, the northern tribe of Israel. Yeah, I mean, Judah, God's people are all doing doing the same exact things. And what God is showing, we know eventually he's going to have Assyria uh, going to come in and take the northern tribe of Israel captive. And so he is going to stop all this. They're, they're laughing and everything else, the feast days, moon, Sabbath. He's going to stop all that because they're going to eventually be brought, in, brought into captivity. This is what God is showing us. Uh, you know, you committed adultery. Uh, now he's going to raise up uh, Assyria, world power is going to come and take the northern tribe of Israel, going to take them into Assyrian captivity. And these, I'm going to tell you, Assyrians are some ruthless people, man. They they are they were very ruthless people. These are people that uh, that uh, Jonah didn't want to go to. You know, Jonah knew God was a merciful God, and he did not want to go to these, these people because he knew how ruthless they were, but he also knew how, how loving and how merciful God was, and if they repent, that God would forgive them, and Jonah didn't think they deserved forgiveness. But what's interesting to me with what Javier read is, is that even in spite of all that Israel is doing, you know, to provoke to provoke God to jealousy and anger, God still says He's going to allure them. You know, He still loves them. He's going to love them enough uh, to allure them. Verse 14, He said, "I'm going to allure her." He's going to bring her into the wilderness, get this, and speak comfortably uh, unto her. And, and so the idea here is God is going to bring her back to the place. Remember where they started. I'm going to start over with you again. Remember when they were delivered from Egyptian bondage, you know, they, they were led into the wilderness. God said, I'm going to bring you back to the place where, where it all started. So you did all this, but I'm going to discipline you. But I still love you. I want to allure you. I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to bring you back to this place where you started. And in verse 15, and I will give her her vineyards from there. And then he says, and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. Okay, so the valley of Achor. Now, what would that bring to mind? Well, the valley of Achor, you remember, was where, uh, let me see, where Joshua, uh, Joshua chapter 7, where Achan. Remember where Achan took the, the articles that God had told him not to take when they destroyed Jericho and he hid them under their tent? And what happened to Achan and his family? Well, they ended up being stoned. Uh, they ended up being killed, him and his family. So what is God saying here? I will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And so I think what God is showing here, God, and this is powerful, what God is showing us that a place that is known for death, a place that was known for uh, rebellion, God says, I can make it a place of hope. God says, I can take what you perceive, what you see as a place of death, and I can bring it hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up out of the land. Remember when they were delivered out of Egyptian bondage? And then once Pharaoh's army uh, went after them and they were drowned in the sea, Exodus 14. And in Exodus 15, God had them to sing a song of Moses and write a song. And so God is showing, you know, once he disciplines you, you repent, I love you, I'm going to call you back, and I can, I can bring hope to a hopeless situation. That's what God is showing us. And, and what's powerful about this is when we, we read the New Testament and we see that we love God because he first loved us. That's key. I, I, while we were yet enemies, Paul says, while we were yet enemies, we were weak and we didn't have strength. 
God in due time, he died for us. And so I think this is kind of the illustration that is showing that we deserve death. We, we don't deserve to have any hope, but God is going to allure us, and hopefully we repent and get ourselves right and, and receive the love that God wants to, to give us, that he can uh, be our husband again, that we can be the bride of Christ. And he, and he does that under that new covenant. Thank you for that, Brother Stevenson. Do we have anyone else that has any questions or comments concerning the scriptures that's been read? You know, only God can do that, brothers and sisters. I, I, I got to stay on the position. That only God can give hope to a hopeless situation. Only God can take something that that is hopeless and give hope. You think about like uh, uh let me think. I'm just thinking like Numbers. You remember the book of Numbers when they were in the wilderness and the serpents were biting them? And what did God tell them to do? God told them, "I want you to take told Moses them. I want you to get a, an image of a serpent and put it on a pole." And then when people looked on it, if they were bit, then they would leave. Now, so God took something, an instrument, uh, an image of something that was killing them, something that represented death, and said, if you look at it, I can give you life and hope. Only God can do that. Only God can give us hope out of a hopeless situation. Only God can take a, 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 a tomb with a dead body and bring life to it. Only God can take, I'm just thinking like Abraham a dead body, Sarah, a dead womb, and put life in it and give hope to it. And so what God is showing us, in him there is no hope. Without him there is no hope. But with him there's hope, brothers and sisters. God can bring hope to a dead life. These people are dead. Uh, but if it was not for God reaching out to them, uh, 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 working with them, alluring them, then there would be no hope. For any of us, and so it's not just them. There is no hope for you and I either, had not God reached out for us through His love. Thank you for that, Brother Stevenson. Do we have anyone else that has any questions or comments concerning these scriptures that's been read? All right. If not, uh, I'm going to ask you, Brother Stevenson, if you don't mind, if you'll go ahead and close out the chapter for us, uh, verses 16 through 23. Yes, sir. And it shall be at that day, said the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shall call me no more Baali. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth, and will make them to lie down safely. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, said the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had, had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, you are my people. And they shall say, you are my God. Thank you for that, Brother Stevenson. Do we have anyone that has any questions or comments concerning these scriptures that's been read? God is showing I'm going to renew a covenant with you. You broke the covenant. You're breaking the relationship. You're unfaithful. You're serving other gods. God says, not only am I going to allure you back, I'm also going to make a covenant with you. I'm going to make a covenant with you. No more. You see that word Ishi? God said they will call God Ishi. That word there, Ishi, is my husband. When you look it up in the Hebrew, they're going to call me their husband. They're going to understand these other gods that you're serving, they're not your husband. I think we understand that. Man. I think we understand in our relationships, our physical relationships. You know, you're a husband. You provide, uh, you know, for your wife. You don't want her out there giving credit to somebody else. You know, for the things that you've been providing. This is what God is saying. You know, hey, now, once you understand that, that they don't love you like I love you, that they didn't give you the thing, you're empty. You know, you find out you're empty out there. You come back to me, I'm going to make this covenant with you. You know, hey, you're going you're gonna to call me husband. They will no longer be confused <clears throat> with, with who the God is. But that's what verse 16 is saying. It shall be at that day, said the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi, and shall call me no more Baali. I mean, that's confusion. How can you confuse that? How in the world are you calling God uh, Baali, my master? The world shouldn't be your master. 
And so God said, I'm going to give you rest, is what he's saying. I'm going to give you rest. You know, all this stuff, the files of the heaven, you're in the wilderness, but I'm going to make sure you're protected. You're going to depend on the Lord, and guess what he's going to do? He's going to take care. He's going to take care of you. It's what he's going to do. And so after spiritual adultery against God, God said, I'm going I'm to betroth you. I'm going I'm to marry you. And, I'm gonna, and, and guess what we're seeing here? What we're seeing here is grace. Because at the end of the day, what have they, what have they done in Hosea 2 to deserve this? Absolutely nothing. What did they do to deserve this grace? Absolutely nothing. But God is still going to restore his love. He's going to restore his love to, the, to these uh, to particular people. And this is where, I'm going to tell you this, this is talking about you and I. We're part of this new covenant that God is talking about. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. I'll read this and I'm done. First Peter chapter 2. This is a covenant that God is talking about. He was going to make with the house of Israel even back in Jeremiah. But when we get to the New Testament, First Peter chapter 2, this is talking about you and I, Gentiles and Christians. Verse 9. We quote this all the time. But listen what he says here. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now look at verse 10. Which in times past, here's our word, were not a people. You see how Hosea said? Not a people. That's what Hosea had been talking about. Okay, now, it was, I'm gonna, it was a people who were not a people, now they're a people. He's talking about us. In times past, we were not a people, but are now the people of God. We had not obtained mercy, but now we've obtained mercy. And this is exactly what we see God showing through the prophet Hosea. I'm going to give you mercy. I'm not going to give you what you do deserve. And that's you and I on this Zoom call who obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're part of this new covenant, and we are married to Christ. Thank you for that, Brother Steve. So go ahead, Brother Javier. Man, thank you, Brother Henry. You know, it just reminds me of... Uh, and Verse number uh, 21, it says, And it shall come to pass in that day I will hear, said the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. The earth shall hear the corn and the wine, the oil, and they shall uh, hear Jezreel. So when it comes to what God opens up in verse six, uh, verse, uh, yeah, verse 16, no, verse 18, will break the bow, bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. Just when it comes to God opening up, there's a communication that's being talked about here that is described. When it comes to when you put a seed in the ground, there is a power and a communication that God does where the dirt, the seed, the sun, and the water, they communicate with each other. And God put that power in effect where now it's going to bloom, the corn's going to come out, uh, the different uh, fig it's going to come out figs, the wine, the oil. It's going to come out because God said it to come out. When it comes to protection, uh, he said in verse 18, uh, break, I will break the bow and the sword and the bow. He's going to keep the saint protected, uh, keep the evil away. And so God is looking out for good and is planning for good for his people. And so I just want to notice that because from heaven, just like in time frame of Egypt, Egypt was getting all the plagues, but the Hebrews, they were right next door. Right next door, they didn't get any of the plagues uh, that Egypt had. You know, the plagues from cattle, the plagues that came from ice, the frogs, the blood, you know, everything that happened to the Egyptians did not happen to the Hebrews. And so it just shows you a detail concerning God's love and the doors that he opened, the protection that he, that he shows his uh his seed and uh his children just want to add that thank you for that brother javier and i was just looking at uh verse number 22 and it says uh and they shall hear jezreel and the meaning of that word jezreel means god will show so it goes to show you <clears throat> that you know these things that god is saying and we know that the scriptures teach us that god cannot lie that, that he's, you're gonna, these things are going to come to pass. You're going to see these things happening. You know, so I just want to share that. Do we have anyone else that has any questions or comments concerning tonight's study? Or is there anything else at this time that you may have that you would like to bring to the group? Uh, yeah, do you hear me? 
Uh, yeah, we can hear a little bit, brother Daddy. Uh, okay. Um, verse 23, it says, uh, I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. I, I like that particular uh, scripture portion uh, because God has, has given us mercy. And remember, he's not only talking about us present day or even Israel. He's talking about this. He's talking about the basically the children of uh, uh, of Osiah. Os and so that sort of dictates that he's expressing a personal sort of personal relationship with this with this uh, particular person with these particular children. And um, I, I wish I could uh, give more evidence of that. But it seems to sh dictate that God, in, in his addressing each of us, has a personal relationship, just like he has a personal relationship with every nation. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you for that, Brother Dave. Do we have anyone else that has any questions or comments concerning either tonight's study or anything else you may have at this time that you would like to bring to the group? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Brother Green, I just want to also mention concerning, uh, you know, when it comes to the Bible, we look at uh, Genesis. You know, God made a covenant with, with Noah when it comes to the bow in the sky, the rainbow. And so that covenant that's being described with Noah is not the des description of, let's say, the new covenant or uh, the old covenant. It's just a covenant description concerning the bow that's in the sky. And so just to, I, I'm, as I'm looking through the scriptures, looking through the Bible, I know there's different times when God mentions covenant, and not all of them describe um, whether it's the New or the Old Testament, but some of them do describe just a, a, an agreement, because that's what the word covenant means, it, it's, it's an agreement. But when it comes to different time frames, there are just times where God makes agreements, whether it be with a person, with the world, with uh, the nation, and then there's covenants where he says in Jeremiah 31, I'm going to make a new covenant uh, with the house of Israel. Not, and then he compares, he said, not like the one I made with their fathers when I brought them out, out of the land of Egypt. So when he says that, he's making a comparison from the new to the old. And so when it comes to Noah, when he says covenant with the bow, that's a different, uh, different covenant. That's just an agreement made that he will not destroy the earth with water. And so there's a lot of details in the scriptures with Hosea, with Jeremiah, Ezekiel, that describe uh, different agreements, different, like for example, the agreement that Daniel read uh, the 70 years, you know, that's an agreement. Hey, 70 years then, he'll come back to, uh, to, to Jerusalem, right? So I just wanted to add that just as a teaching tool to, uh, to, to look at concerning us reading the Bible and just uh, recognizing uh, when God is talking about uh, which covenant and which details. Thank you. Thank you for that, Brother Javier. Do we have anyone else that has any questions or comments concerning uh, tonight's study or anything else you may have like to bring to the group at this time? In Romans 9 and verse 24, you know, we read this, even us, Paul says, whom he had called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. He says, as he said also in Hosea, so Paul brings up Hosea in Romans 9, 25. I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, you are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also cried concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteous, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. As Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a sea, we had been a, as Sodom and, and, and been like unto Gomorrah. And then you go back down to verse 18. Therefore he had mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he hardened, he will harden. Man, thank you, Brother Henry. Yeah, that's a great scripture. That's the one that matches the mate, you know, for Hosea. I was just thinking about uh, Romans 10, where it says, but I say, Romans 10, uh, 19, but I say, did not Israel know 
First Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation uh, I will anger you. But Isaiah is very bold. He said, I was found of them that saw me not. I was made manifest unto them that acts not after me. And so here he's just describing the Gentiles again in, uh, in uh, verse 19 and verse 20. Well, this is Moses' description. This is Isaiah's description. But when you're describing Romans 9, that's actually the one that's uh, describing Hosea and uh, in that chapter concerning. But there's other descriptions like Isaiah and Moses where they mentioned uh, the Gentiles uh, in Romans 10, 19 through 20. So I appreciate it, brother. Is there anyone else that has any questions or comments concerning the scriptures that's been read tonight, tonight's study, or anything else you may have that you would like to bring to the group at this time? All right, if there's not, I would like to thank everyone for taking time out of their day and participating in tonight's study. Please don't forget, tomorrow night, um, 7.30 Central Standard Time on Brother Stevenson's Zoom page, uh, Brother Stevenson will be continuing in his lesson on Kingdom Marriages and Kingdom, fam uh, kingdom Families. All right, so don't forget, 7.30 Central Standard Time on Brother Stevenson's Zoom page. Also, this Thursday, we'll be in Hosea chapter 3. Now, this is a, a, a very short chapter in Hosea chapter 3. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to give Brother Stevenson a rest because this brother does so much work for the kingdom. You know, so I'm going to give him a rest on Hosea chapter 3. And got a little special little treat for Thursday. And I'm going to keep it like that. I'm going to save it until Thursday. But... Uh, this Thursday will be in Hosea chapter 3. Uh, once again, before we close out, is there anyone that has any questions or comments concerning tonight's study or any other questions you may have to bring to the group? All right. If not, um, I ask Brother Coffee, my brother, if you don't mind, if you'll please close us out with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Most gracious Father in heaven, we thank you, Father, for this day that you have made, that we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We thank you, Father, for allowing us to get this far in our day with our minds set on to, um, to look at another portion of your word. We thank you, Father, for the word which was taught to us, Father, that we are getting more understanding of the things that you require of us even um, in this new dispensation. We thank you, Father, for the time that Brother Stevenson prepared these lessons for us. We thank you, Father, for his family and all of those that's given him support and things that he desired to do. We could continue to pray for all of us on this Zoom, pray for our families, our children, uh, pray for our loved ones, Father, that are not saved. We pray, oh, Father, for the obedience of our, even for ourselves as, as leaders in our homes and continue to speak to our children, speaking life into them, that they obey the things which are written. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your love and your long suffering. You've given us all an opportunity to be a part of your kingdom. We ask your Heavenly Father that you forgive us, Lord, of our sins and cleanse us, Father, from all unrighteousness. Continue to give us you know, the protection that you said in your word, Father, that you'll never leave us nor will you forsake us. Give us rest tonight, Father, that we would, that we would sleep and that you would look over us, Father, and that you would, if it's your will, Father, that we rise again this morning, that we will have you on, on our minds, that we will continue to do the work that you've called us to do. So we thank you, Father, for all that you've given unto us. You bless us, Father, in this dying world, that we can continue to contend for the faith, continue to search the scriptures, continue to challenge ourselves, Father, to examine ourselves and making sure that we are in the faith. So we thank you, Father, for this time of prayer. We thank you for our brethren, which are here, that we continue to um, come together and to study and to learn more, that we can uh, be more effective evangelists, Father, as we sojourn through this life so we thank you and ask these blessings in your son jesus name we pray amen amen thank amen. you brother Carl. wonderful prayer yeah. preacher but once again everyone um just thank you all for taking the time out to join tonight's study um and i'm gonna ask you all be safe because i don't know if you all can hear it but they're going off of these fireworks over here so you all be safe uh, especially if you have to get out and move around uh, anytime this evening. And once again, don't forget tomorrow night, 7.30, Brother Stevenson's Zoom page, uh, Kingdom Marriages and, and Kingdom Families. 
and Thursday, Hosea chapter 3. And like I said, we're going to give our dear brother a rest because he does so much. And, you know, we thank God for him and appreciate him. And I hope you all sign in on Thursday because I think it's going to be a pretty special treat come this Thursday uh, concerning Hosea chapter 3. So with that being said, everyone, may God continue to bless and keep each and every one of you. Love you all with the love of Christ. Until we meet again, good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.